Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Martina Barbero, and I'm a policy manager at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, which is a network of over 280 partners from all around the world, working together to ensure that the data revolution is used to achieve the sustainable development goals. I will be your host today for this discussion. This is the 27th webinar of a series continuing the conversation between the UN World Data Forums. The next forum will take place in Hangzhou, China, between the 23rd to the 27th of April 2022. Like the forum, the webinar series aimed to share experience and open a dialogue between the global community of data producer and data users, whether they are part of governments, academia, civil society, private sector, and other institutions, in order to spur innovation, mobilize high-level political and financial support for data, and build a pathway to better data for sustainable development. I hope you can hear me, and I see that the slides disappeared, but I will continue, so please let me know if I should stop. So this webinar and topic of today is about the legislative rules for accessing privately held data, lessons learned and implications from the European Union Data Act for the global statistical community. Discussion around the use of, um, uh, the, of privately held data for uh, public policy and for development of and production of statistics have been around for over a decade. But in the past few years, thanks to COVID, we have realized the importance of relying on uh, privately held data for especially emergency response. Uh, so this debate is really timely right now. And um, what we will do today is to take the opportunity and start from the Data Act that was recently published by the European Commission to discuss about what's going on uh, in other parts of the world, if there is an appetite for this type of legislative solution for access to privately held data in other regions, and also to discuss what, what, what is the benefits for national statistical offices from these rules. So we have an amazing list of speakers for today, and I'm really excited to get us started. But before we do start, there are a few housekeeping notes that I need to share with you. First of all, we have live interpretation from English to Spanish and from Spanish to English today, which means that you have, two, uh, you have the opportunity to choose the language channel that you prefer. When you go on the bottom of your screen on, uh, on Zoom, you have a small word icon, and then you can see that is uh, called interpretation. And you can either decide to listen to this webinar in English, in Spanish, or in the language that is spoken by the speakers, which is meaning, meaning without interpretation. So we will have one Spanish intervention and the rest will be in English. The second thing that I would like to ask you to do is to uh, introduce yourself. So let's find out who is in the room. I invite, you, uh, I invite you to find the chat function, which is the small icon on the bottom of your screen that looks like a speech bubble. And you can type in two words, the country you're joining from and the sector you represent, national statistical office, private sector, international organization or else. Uh, please consider that we will use the chat function to communicate during the webinar. Uh, and you can also use the chat, uh, the chat function to ask your question during this webinar. We already have received a large number of questions in advance that we have used to shape this conversation. However, we will take also a few questions from those that you will post right now during the conversation. So do not hesitate to do so. Now that the housekeeping is done, uh, I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker, Maria Rosaria Cuduti. Maria Rosaria has been working as a policy and legal officer at the European Commission in the Data Policy and Innovation Unit since October 2018. She has played an active role in the definition of the data strategy of the European Commission and its implementation, and she was a member of the team that drafted both the Data Governance Act and the Data Act. Before joining the European Commission, Maria Rosaria worked in the field of international relations and foreign policy at the European External Action Service and at the Stockholm-based Institute for Security and Development Policy. She studied political science at the University of Bologna, where she graduated cum laude in international relations. She conducted two years of postgraduate research at the School of East Asian Studies, University of Sheffield. Maria Rosaria, we're very happy to have you uh, as, a, as a panelist today and to kick us off. So the floor is yours. 
Hi everyone, thank you very much Martina. I'm, I'm glad to be here and talk about the Data Act. And, um, but first of all, let me zoom out for a moment to give you a bit introduction of, of, of our data policies, um, whose main objective is to make Europe a leading model globally for a data empowered society and economy. The Data Act that we will discuss today is the second major legislative initiative. Esta ley de datos es la segunda iniciativa principal anunciada en febrero del 2020. Segunda ley de access and use of data with the rollout of and funding of common European data spaces in various sectors of the economy and domains of public interest in order to build the single European market for data. Uh, the vision, our vision, uh, is based on four elements. Data can flow between sectors and countries. Ample of data is available for reuse and use. Data is used in full respect of European values and clear rules on data access and use are in place. By implementing the, the, this strategy, we are modernizing the European legislative framework in light of digital advances to remove remaining and emerging barriers to the widespread use and reuse of data within and across member states and sectors to encourage digital innovation. And we also want that public sector body make um, harness the potential of the data revolution. Whereas the Data Governance Act focused on increasing trust in the involuntary data sharing by regulating the neutral trusted data intermediaries, the Digital Markets Act targeted the market power of the gatekeeper platforms and the implementing act of high on high value data sets will unleash the socioeconomic potential of data as a raw material for innovation. The key objective of the Data Act is to ensure fairness in the allocation of data value among the various actors in the data economy. There is no value in data. Everyone would like to capture the whole value. If we don't sort out who gets the value, data will simply be less used, which is a problem. This is particularly the case of Internet of Things objects. All kinds of smart objects we have in our households or are used in industry, such as factory robots, harvesting machines, etc. Things used to be quite simple in the past. But how does that work for objects that generate data? Do the data belong to the manufacturer of the object, to the user, or even to a third party who has an interest in it? Things are simply not clear. The Data Act regulates economic rights and data, further empower consumers in the data economy, and it aims at clarifying who can use what data and under which conditions. Of course, the Data Act complements general data protection regulation by strengthening the right to data portability by extending it also to non-personal data. The Data Act does not create exclusive rights on data. On the contrary, it aims at reducing the obstacles for different actors to access and use the data. What we do with the Data Act is create possibilities for the users of the connected objects, including both individuals, businesses, to get access to the data or to give it to a third party. At the same time, the manufacturers keep the possibility to use the data. The Data Act is also an um, SME's instrument and companies are prohibited from unilaterally imposing unfair contractual related um, clauses to data sharing on SMEs. Uh, on cloud services, the proposal will enable the switching between services addressing existing lock-in effects. And then there are the business to government provision that will facilitate the use of business data for public institutions in exceptional situations such as emergencies. The pandemic has shown the need for a governance framework to allow the public sector to access and use certain data from companies. This is about public sector bodies not getting the right data. It is also about companies getting multiple requests for the same data and the need for streamlined procedures. This confirms what expert group on business to government data sharing reported, is reported in 2020. With the Data Act, we harmonize at new level business to government data sharing by providing rules on how requests for data um, should be made in this context. We define the conditions under which the mechanism can be activated. It is a limited and targeted mechanism for cases where the public sector cannot get data through normal means. 
for example, reporting obligations in law or buying or procuring the data on the market. So it is about exceptional needs. For emergencies, it is clear data has to be shared and for free. About the other situation, this is for cases where a public sector really needs body, really needs the data for fulfilling a task in the public interest that has been explicitly provided in law. That is the first condition. The burden of proof is on the public sector body. Then there is a second condition that can be fulfilled in two ways. Either it has done, the public sector body has done everything to get the data by other means, and new reporting obligations introduced by law cannot be put in place on time, or getting the data will lead to a considerable reduction of the administrative burden on companies. Think about the statistical office, for example, sending out service. Public sector bodies will have to demonstrate that their requests for data to companies are justified and based on exceptional needs, as defined by the Data Act. Those requests will also have to respect several specific conditions to be admissible, notably regarding their proportionality and transparency. Member states should assign a competent authority responsible for business to government data sharing the task to handle disputes because a company can um, is not obliged uh, um, to handle the requests always if, it, if the company thinks that the public sector body is, is not asking um, the right uh, request. The Data Act will make possible for streamlining of procedures to ensure less administrative burden for companies. In the statistical context, the replacement of questionnaires by the use of scanner data can alleviate the burden of reporting obligations for companies. And the lesson we learned by um, putting in place the pro these provisions of data for public good is that we need to find a sustainable business model acceptable also to the private companies that um, share their data with public sector bodies and stati official statistical um, institutions. So um, according to the Data Act, um, will be entitled to request data to private companies when there is an exceptional need. Thank you very much. I think I've exhausted my time. Thank you very much, Maria Rosari. I think it was a splendid introduction and you clarified already so many things about the Data Act, uh, about the exceptional need, but also about the, uh, the conditions that need to be put in place. So I think we will have a lot of questions for you later on, but for the moment, we will move to the, our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Rosica Zaimova. Uh, oh, sorry, no, my mistake. Our next speaker is uh, um, Federico Segui. Federico is the Deputy Director General of the National Statistical Office of Uruguay. He is also responsible for the implementation of the Data Warehouse, Integrated System of Statistical Registers and Surveys at the National Statistical Institution. He has more than 25 years of experience in official statistics. Federica has been a consultant for international organizations such as the World Bank, United Nations, Paris 21, OECD, and others, as an expert in official statistics based on administrative registers, data management, IT for statistics, quality of statistics, metadata, and microdata anonymization. He's also the author of several publications and papers on those topics. Uh, finally, Federico is an elected member of international organization and a member of working group on, groups on data stewardship of government data, administrative registers, data quality, amongst others. I'm very, very happy to have Federico uh, with us today as a, as a panelist to share uh, a bit his, uh, his thoughts about uh, the implication of the Data Act. So Federico will be speaking in Spanish. For the English speaking uh, colleagues that are joining this call, if you go uh, to the interpretation button, which is on the bottom of your screen, you can switch to the English channel and you will get the translation, the interpretation. For those that can listen to Federico uh, in Spanish, they can stay on this channel. Thank you very much, Federico, the floor is yours. Um, gracias, Martina. Eh, bueno, eh, muy buenos días, buenas tardes, eh, buenas noches para, para todos. Depending on where you may be, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in this very important webinar. Thanks to the UN World Data Forum for this invitation, and also thanks to Martina. I'm going to speak with pauses to facilitate the interpreter's job today. Next slide, please. To begin, I would like to highlight a pair of concepts 
that Maria Rosario already mentioned, which are very important and are stipulated in the Data Act. One that's more general and one that's more specific to the NSOs. First is this quote, by facilitating data access and use the Data Act should reduce burdens, burdens both in the public sector and among businesses, mainly as a result of lowering transaction costs and in terms of efficiency gains. And the second concept, which is highly important and is more related to NSOs, which is the exceptional need of accessing privately held data by the public sector, which not only contemplates emergency situations, but also considers the uh, timely compilation of uh, official statistics when the data is not available any other way, or when the burden of those surveyed is significantly reduced. And this last point is critical for NSOs in order to access to privately held data under this concept of exceptional needs. And what I will cover in this brief presentation are lessons learned from the European experience, which are relevant for NSOs and implica implications on data sharing experiences in national statistical offices and benefits for the NSOs. Next slide, please. And just to illustrate the difficulties that we have currently in NSOs to access privately held data, allow me to mention a situation we had recently in regards to accessing data from uh, mobiles. In 2020, during the pandemic, the need came up, just as in many other countries, to have timely information about mobility of individuals for making decisions on health policies. So we began uh, initiatives to obtain data from the three telecom operators in the country, which are Claro, Telefonica, Movistar, and the Antel state company, which has 50% of the market share currently. Obtaining the data from Antel, the state company, was relatively simple. Of course, we were in the pandemic, and by being a state company, evidently this simplified things. But with the other two private companies, we were not able to obtain the data that we needed. We held various meetings with them, with the technicians. We held discussions with the technicians to review the requirements, that it be feasible for them to discuss the times, etc. And in this process, we had support from international organizations. They also facilitated a consultant to us in order to perform a mapping of the processes. It was an arduous task, it lasted more, a year, more than a year and a half, and we still were not able to obtain the data except for the data that the state company provided. And so, which was helpful to have an initial experience with the data to generate statistics based on these new sources of information. It was new for us, at least. So we changed the strategy. We worked via the regulator of telecoms in the country. And this also took a long time to convince them of the importance of this data for the country. And for them specifically, 
overall due to the critical infrastructure. And we are in that process working currently, but it has been very, very tedious. And I would also like to mention that the statistics law of Uruguay from 1994, which evidently needs to be updated to adapt it to the current needs and the current circumstances. At that time, they wouldn't talk about administrative records for statistical purposes, not officially at least. And we definitely did not talk in that time about privately held data. However, that law does not limit access to these type of data. That's why we're currently undergoing these initiatives and these processes that I mentioned earlier. But I believe if we were to have a law similar to the Data Act of the EU, it would be, I'm sure, much easier. Easier at least to incorporate certain aspects of that Data Act to the Uruguayan legislation. And it's not enough, it would be a necessary condition, but would not be enough. These acts should be complemented by other initiatives, uh, collaborative projects, for example, incentives of different types for different sectors. And once again, the concept of exceptional need would be critical here to facilitate access to privately held data by NSO. Next slide, please. Let us, let us look at the implications of, data, of the Data Act on NSOs. In reality, this would be a benefit to the private companies to ask for data only once from the public sector. And after they are shared with the public sector, the direct access via data request to the private sector and indirectly through secondary data sharing in public sector. These would be the explanations for NSOs. And to think about going from incentives and buying data to compensations. In the case of Uruguay, we do not have the possibility of buying data, but rather use incentives to provide some type of information. That could be used in this information exchange. Next slide, please. In regards to the benefits for NSOs, clearly this allows us to ensure and regulate access to privately held data. In some cases, this data, well, would not have a cost for the NSO when they, when they have been obtained via this measure. In other cases, we foresee a reasonable cost to provide direct access. And I believe my time is running now. Next slide, please. Just as final remarks, I can mention that the Data Act will have a huge impact on the global and local discussions. The proof is in the amount of participants we have in this webinar. And it's necessary to have a broad discussion to include key interested parties and all interested parties. It's an act that will include all sectors. In the case of Uruguay, we believe that it's important to work with the e-government agency, HSIC. And the regulator of 
personal data, and I don't have enough time to go into greater detail there, but it would be key to have their participation. And we also have to have a discussion with members of the national statistical system. Thank you very much for your time. It was a, a incredible, as always, to have you and presenting your experience with Uruguay and what you tried to do with the MNO is very, very helpful. I think we will have questions for you as well in a few minutes, but we now move to Rosica, who is our next speaker. Rosica Zaimova, she is a partner and co-founder at Dalberg Data Insights, and uh, which is the big data entity of the Dalberg Group. Rosica is based in Kampala, Uganda, and in the past six years, she has managed the design and development of data ecosystem and data-driven products in sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on energy, public health, gender, youth, employment, agriculture, and poverty. On a day-to-day -day basis, she manages a complex ecosystem of data providers, data users, regulators, and funders, and she has been advising digital and data strategies with governments and development partners that set the foundation for the digital transformation in um, SSA. Rosica has a Bachelor of Economics uh, from the American University in Bulgaria and a Master of Science in International Management from ESA, the Business School in Spain. She's an Acumen East African Fellow and was recently named one of the Forbes 30 under 30 social entrepreneurs in Europe. Rosica, thank you very much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Martina, and good afternoon, everyone. Great to virtually connect with so many people from all over the world. Um, I think it's timely actually to come right after Federico as I carry the private sector hat. And I'm going to speak in the next few minutes um, on behalf of my organization, Dalberg Data Insights, um, and particularly focus on more the practical takeaways and learnings from over seven years of experience facilitating public-private partnerships. And of course, you know, touch upon how the Data Act could um, you know, enable such partnerships at a larger scale, but also what are the needed um, things in place beyond just the leg legislation to be able to, to do those partnerships at scale. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and before I start just briefly about my organization, um, we are part of a global group that is working towards building a more sustainable and inclusive world where everyone can reach their fullest potential. We're about 700 of us in 24 locations all over the world. Uh, next one, please. And we encompass a wide variety of expertise, not only data analytics, but strategy consulting, um, design and implementation, research um, catalysts, et cetera, building initiatives. Um, and here I'm um, representing Dalberg Data Insights, an organization that has been working actually with the private and the public sector over the last seven, eight years, uh, enabling such data uh, public-private partnerships. Can we go to the next slide? So basically we have been working not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but actually Africa overall um, in Asia and in Latin America um, with some of the largest telecom operators facilitating um, the basically data access so that the data that we encourage everyone to see as an asset can be used to advance the sustainable development goals. And in that case, you know, it's quite important to actually look at both the supply of data, but also the demand of data and be able to, to, to bridge that gap. As Federico mentioned, during the pandemic, actually, we saw the acceleration of, um, you know, actually the need um, to unlock private sector data. However, even when the legislations were there, um, we missed some of the technical infrastructures in place and actually missed to actually was the, the, the incentives of the private sector to share such data. And if I need to bring a concrete example um, from, from my experience, in Belgium, my, organizations, uh, my organization worked with the three uh, telecom operators in Belgium, so Proximus, Orange, and Telenet, where within two weeks, we managed to get access to the CDR's data, um, which pre-pandemic times, that would have taken probably six months or one year or even a little bit more. Um, at that point of time, the Data Act was not enacted, um, obviously, but what really helped was actually having the operators fully um, come in, having the right technical infrastructure to be able to share that data smoothly. And the other aspect that really helped actually was having the Ministry of uh, Digital at that point of time. And today, um, the Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander de Croo, literally um, had that initiative 
and require the telecom operators to come quickly on board. I believe with the Data Act today, that will happen even faster, right? But we have seen challenges happening, you know, that being um, enabled before the pandemic, that access to the data. And now, you know, um, the challenges remain. So I do think that such an act will facilitate that data exchange, but it will not be sufficient uh, because we need a lot more than that. And in the next few minutes, let me share some of the takeaways that I think will be essential for such a exchange to happen. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so basically, you know, throughout our work, we really encourage organizations, public and private, as well as the individuals to see the data as an asset. The data has been increasing in volume. The data has become an essential output or byproduct of digital. And as such, we need to look at it as an asset, right? And that means that when we facilitate such public-private data exchanges, we really need to, to start not only from the data, but rather from the use cases. The data literacy is key, fostering a data community. The legislations are really essential. Um, but if organizations, public and private, and the individual do not fully understand what their rights are, how they can control, how they can leverage data, then I think the data asset is fully under leveraged. And finally, the trust. Um, the data governance is, is really, really key for, um, for basically ensuring that de that data exchange can happen with the consent of, of, of the individual rights. And that we've seen the more the individual trusts their governments, I think, the, the smoother such data exchanges um, will be. Can we go to the next slide, please? And this is just a quick representation of kind of one perspective of how we can look at the data market um, in a sense. Um, because here, you know, I think that the EU um, in many of the documents we've seen, they refer to data spaces. It can be also data market. And when we talk about an asset, we inevitably talk about the data market. When we have consumers, as individuals, we have governments, we have businesses, we have a lot of submarkets that they're creating there. Submarkets such as B2C or C2B, think about the big tech and us using the technologies. Think about the B2B market um, of data that can actually be facilitated by such an act. And then we talk about here the government and consumer or government and business that you know is, is as essential, but also the other way around. And I feel the submarkets that we are looking at here um, could further be granularized, you know, if we add other components such as geography, if we add sector specific uh, data, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And here, my key message is that, you know, the carrot and stick, so regulations versus incentives um, will apply differently depends on what type of market we're looking at, what is the context and the geography, etc. Um, and some, you know, um, in some cases, we will need Certainly regulations I think are always important, but then the incentives might, might vary depending on the market we are looking at. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, second and very important is we need to start investing more in data literacy for both the public, the private sector and the individuals. Um, the Data Act will be essential to unlock the power of the data, but I think we all agree that society empowered by data is only when the society is data literate. Um, I actually just copied a, a quote from the Data Act proposal that states new rules are allowing customers to effectively switch between different cloud data processing services providers and put in place safeguards against unlawful data transfer. All of us here work in data, but how many of us actually fully understand this phrase? And how many of us are able to switch different cloud data processing services when we work with different providers? I mean, I know, Kind of, you probably get the point here, but we need to start investing in data literacy, uh, both for the individual, if we talk about, um, you know, data sovereignty and control of the data, but also for the organizations themselves. Um, maybe for Frederick, it was a bit harder to get access to the data, not only because the legislations were not there, but also there were no technical infrastructures probably to be able to facilitate um, secure access to data in a very efficient way. And if we have that in place, if we have a community, both within the public and private sector that are complete, completely data literate on that aspect, and individuals that are empowered by data knowledge, um, I think we are going to talk about the data market that is that is flourishing. Can we go to the last slide, please? I believe. And finally, as I mentioned before, um, I think the transparency and trust 
will be as important um, as the regulations themselves. Um, and those in certain geographies even more than others. Um, I think we've seen during the pandemic how certain governments were more prepared just because they used data, let's say more effectively, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the citizens really trusted how the governments will use that data. And I think for such a data market to flourish, uh, we need to ensure that that trust, trust and transparency is there. Just consider, for example, and GDPR and obviously the Data Act puts the, 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 the individual in the center, uh, right? Enabling the individual to fully um, leverage and control um, the data that we create. But how many of us actually fully understand how our data is being used? Uh, in the most, you know, typical option is Obviously we have an opt-out option, but the default is always opt-in when it comes to data sharing. And many of us don't even know where we share data for. And I believe for a thriving data marketplace or data spaces as the EU calls them to, to thrive and to, to, to flourish, uh, we need to make sure that we create the right um, transparency mechanisms for both individuals, companies, governments um, to, to, to basically uh, ensure the trust of the individual. And I think that's, it's from thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Rosita. That was uh, very interesting, and we're lucky to have a private sector perspective also today uh, during this webinar to to you know to get the full picture of uh, of uh, of this topic. Uh, we now have our last but not least panelist, uh, Dr. Pierre de Rocher. Pierre de Rocher is the director and chief privacy officer at Statistics Canada. He provides leadership on programs, projects, services, and administrative policies in information and data. Prior to this position, he held various positions and functions within the Privy Council Office, Indigenous Service Canada, Public Service and Procurement Canada, and Library and Archives Canada. He holds a PhD from the University of Montréal in Applied Human Science within the interdisciplinary field of information science and public administration. Dr. Desrochers was appointed in 2019 as Canada School of Public Service Digital Academy Fellow in Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. He's a frequent lecturer at the École Nationale d'Administration Publique and an adjunct professor at the School of Information Study at the University of Ottawa. He has recently published a book on administrative data in the digital era at the Press de l'Université du Québec. Dr. Desrochers, we're very happy to have you and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first off, I'm grateful to be gathering with you from Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe First Nation. We're the first people to walk the lands on which Canada's national capital is located today. Um, my thanks also to the invitation to the UN World Data Forum webinar to discuss legislative rules for accessing privately held data. My comments and lessons learned are centered on the Canadian experience from a practical experience and founded in public administration considerations. I have a few remarks, uh, opening remarks, and then I want to give us also time to have uh, Q's and A's. Um, we can all agree that the privately held data is a future source of data for national statistical offices. Its use by some may be limited by existing local legislative frameworks and trade agreements that try to address various data issues such as transporter data flows and accessing privately held data. European rules such as the Data Governance Act and the Data Act represents a unique solution to a localized problem. Striking a balance between the use of data in the public interest and the privacy rights of the individual can be difficult. And it requires complex public policy evaluations for NSOs. The Government of Canada and its national statistical organization, Statistics Canada, has in place, place broad powers to collect privately held data that removes many of the legal barriers, doesn't stifle innovation, and equally important, doesn't represent an administrative burden for data providers. However, it needs to be variated by concerns for acceptability, both social and organizational, and emerging issues of public policy by decision makers. This is very similar to what Rosita just presented to us on trust and transparency. Furthermore, at Statistics Canada, we have various processes and frameworks established to ensure complete oversight of the data in our control and the, the collection of alternative data, such as privately held data. For example, we apply a necessity and proportionality ethical framework at the time of collection, use, and disclosure of the data. We also borrowed for the five says framework from the UK for the protection and ensuring confidentiality of our data. We also have a quality assurance framework, a privacy framework of which I'm the chief privacy officer. 
and recently created a framework for responsible machine learning. These frameworks support our commitment for responsible data stewardship. To demonstrate our commitment to Canadians that we should respect their data, we ensure that we are transparent on the collection, use, and disclosure of the data. We created a trust center on our public facing website where we tell Canadians what we are doing. For example, on the trust center, we acquire data such as how Statistics Canada acquires and uses telephone uh, numbers under the authority of the Statistics Act to ensure that all Canadian households, including those that use cell phones exclusively, are contacted and represented so that our surveys can produce an accurate picture that reflects all the people of Canada. And we have done this since 1989. In 2017, we modified the Statistics Act, our home statute, to ensure the independence of the chief statistician and ensuring that data is managed using professional standards. We have adopted the principle of responsible privacy, which is meant to honor our commitment to privacy of Canadians through these actions. These processes or actions help guide our agencies to use the data, including privately held data in a responsible manner. Um, just to conclude, like I said, I had a few remarks. Um, at Statistics Canada, the pandemic not only accelerated the many enhancements that we had initiated over the last five years to our programs, spurred by the need to collect more data in alternative ways such as privately held data. For example, we uh, managed to improve the quality and coverage of our of inflation estimates through our consumer price index by collecting grocery prices through point of sales data. We also adopted to the new realities Canadian face in the pandemic by providing more granular estimates of income consumption, savings and wealth amongst different household types. We're now using these data to show how pandemic support measures have impacted specific groups. And in partnerships with provinces and municipalities, the Canadian Housing Statistics Program offers a richer understanding of the factors driving housing markets, provides detailed information on the social economic characteristics of new home buyers and homeowners, including the financial characteristics. None of this information could have been produced without access to individual citizens. Again, happy to have conversation and to engage in the question period with our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Derocher, and it's a very, uh... Uh, refreshing to hear what's going on in Canada as well and all these uh, these great initiatives that you just mentioned. So what will happen for the next, let's say, around 20 minutes, we will um, we took some of the questions that you participants have asked during uh, your registration, and we're going to turn them to the speakers. Uh, but in the meantime, while we do that, I encourage you to post questions in the chat because we will have a few minutes afterwards to also ask any original question that, that can, um, can be found in the chat during this conversation. The first question that we would like to, to ask to our panelists is actually a question for Maria Rosaria and maybe Federico as well, if he wants to give it a stab. And the question is, what drove the EU regulators to establish the rules included in the Data Act for access to privately held data? And what could drive other regulators to do the same and follow a similar approach? Uh, Maria Rosaria, please go ahead. And then Federico, you let me know if you want to take it as well. Uh, thank you very much, Martina. Um, so the, the, the overall problem that we um, try to, to uh, address, um, not only with the Data Act, but you know, with the entire data strategy, is the insufficient availability of data for use within the, the European economy. Um, this is mainly due to lack of clarity on data rights, imbalances in negotiating power, limited access to fair and trustworthy cloud services, and lack of cross-sector data interoperability in the European Union. So we have been um, working on this um, for quite some time, um, even you know, uh, the, some years before the publication of the data strategy. Uh, because from you know, talking with many and different stakeholders across the union um, and conducting several um, uh, online consultation um, and um, um, procuring several uh, studies um, you know, to really see what's going on um, out there in all the contexts from business to business, business to government, business to consumer. Um, so we um, uh, did a very um, deep um, collection of evidence uh, that brought you know, up um, that consumers and companies have limited ability to realize the value of data generated by um, their use of products. 
that there are low levels of data uh, availability for creating added value in business to business relations, um, that there are in inefficient practices for use of private sector data by public sector, um, creating most of the time burden for companies. Um, there are barriers to, of, to switching of cloud and edge services and risks on, of unlawful third country um, access to data. So from these problems, then we observed several consequences, like there is limited competition, slower data innovation, there less consumer choice and higher prices for data products and services, loss of European competitiveness in the global data economy, low quality public service deliver and market fragmentation, and lack of necessary and adequate com computing resources for data sharing. These are um, the specific uh, consequences that we tried to um, address um, with the Data Act. And um, whilst the Data Governance Act was more uh, about creating trust, as um, my colleague was, um, uh, Rosita was saying uh, just before, uh, with the Data Governance Act, we created the framework, the trustworthy framework and conditions um, for everyone that wants to share the data, to do it in, in, in safe um, and trusted way. And with the Data Act, we clarify in, we try to clarify exactly who can do what with which data. Um, so the ultimate goal is to um, uh, increase trust in data sharing access and use, to make more data at the service of the economy, of, of um, the society, uh, and really try to, to harness this huge um, uh, amount of in also industrial data that um, is created in Europe. Um, and let's just keep in mind that the Data Act is, is, is an internal market instrument. So um, we always have to find the right balance between um, the interest of all the stakeholders involved, the private sector stakeholders, the public sector stakeholders, um, the citizens, of course, we want to empower them um, uh, um, to have control on the data, on their personal data, but also the data that they contribute to, to produce by using the smart object. So um, these are, um, and, and in, we um, go to legislation um, when we have um, enough evidence that the guidelines, the principles that are already are there, and also the Commission published already some guidance for sharing private sector data back in 2018, um, but then uh, they didn't really work. Um, so that's why then we uh, we had um, we worked on this on this proposal, um, on this legislative proposal that we don't really see as as a stick. Um, but it's it's uh, a way to make sure that more data is used uh, in, um, in in trusted way, respectful of the interest of all the stakeholders. Thank you very much, Maria Rosaria. And I understand that, that you don't see it as a stick, and this terminology has been used uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, Federica, I'm not sure uh, if you want to take it, but I would be curious to hear, based on the experience you had with the mobile network operators in recent times if you think that down the road that there might be something that would drive uh, your colleagues in the Uruguay government to, to go in the same direction, or if you think this is something that is really not on the table and will not be at all. Uh, I hope so. I hope that we start having the discussion here with the Uruguayan government. This is very recent. But we hope that this stimulates a discussion with the government agencies in Uruguay so that we do follow a similar path. Like I said earlier, we have already started to talk and discuss these aspects. As I mentioned during my presentation, we had an experience of trying to obtain the data from mobile network operators, and we obtained uh, some data, but we found many obstacles, and this motivates us to work in this same line. And as I also said during the presentation, it's not enough just with the legal framework. It's not enough to up update our statistics law but we also need to complement that 
with other actions. But I believe that it would be very important. We had the personal data protection law. That was a model adopted here in Uruguay. I believe the Data Act would also be useful as a benchmark so that we can adapt it, obviously, to the Uruguayan context, the national context, and that would be very important. Thank you very much, Federico. That's, uh, that's really interesting, uh, interesting to hear. Um, I think I have now a question for Rosica and then a question for Pierre, and then we will go back to uh, Maria Rosario and Federico. So first, the question for Rosica. Uh, you mentioned this question of uh, stick and carrot in a sense when speaking about uh, legislation being one of the possible approaches. And you also mentioned that there are different markets that might need different types of incentives in terms of carrot or stick, although uh, you know this, this question of stick uh, was raised that Maria Rosaria legislation is not necessarily always a stick. But just wanted to let you uh, elaborate if you wish on you know where do you think other incentives might lie, and what are the difference between the different markets, and and where you know more carrots or more sticks might be needed. Yeah, thanks, Martina. It's a great question, actually. And you know, I think we need both. Um, and in some instances, regulation is more needed than incentives, but incentives are also very key um, in practice, right? Um, to make it more concrete, I think in the B two C market or C two B consumer to business, think of all the tech sector, we need proper regulations there. And I think we all um, would agree with that, right? If you let the tech sector does whatever they want without regulations, I don't think we want to live in that world, right? So we need regulations and maybe less incentives. But if you talk about the government to business, business to government, also government to government, I think actually the incentives there become really important. Um, and I think uh, Maria Rosaria did mention, you know, that the free access to data, you also mentioned sustainable business models. I actually think, you know, private sector is there to, to make money in the first place. And I've worked with the telcos for the last seven years. And I tell you that they, for them to share, efficiently access to the data, they need to actually have someone full time almost working on that they need to invest in infrastructure that actually costs money. So how they do that if they don't have the incentive, not only the regulation, right? And in that case, even financial incentives. So it's a sustainable business model for them, um, even if it's not about making a lot of money, but about at least covering the cost. So I do think that it's a fine line and a good balance between incentives and regulations. But I believe all of us agree that uh, regulations are, are very key for all these sub-markets that I mentioned before. Thank you very much, Rosita. That's, that's very helpful already. And then going back to Pierre, I think Pierre, with the, with the experience that you, you bring in terms of from a privacy uh, perspective, my question for you will be in terms of the challenges that access to privately held data raise in terms of, of privacy and data protection. Uh, and if you have experience in Canada on how you dealt with some of these challenges, or if you want to share your, your consideration around that, that would be awesome. Appreciate it. In fact, Federico and uh, Rosita, uh, uh, really articulated when, especially Frederico, in terms of the, the issues that he's uh, currently having in his country, um, there are localized problems. Privacy frameworks across the, the world, when it, talking with the Data Act, um, interplay differently depending on the jurisdiction that we're working in. In Canada, we have a complex uh, different environment uh, for privacy depending on my provinces, municipalities, as well as the federal government. And there are various uh, ways that we're working with uh, both my Department of Justice and uh, the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to update some of our privacy legislation to ensure also that the national statistical organizations are represented in that environment. I think that's very important because um, I see this as an interplay between two dimensions. As, as Rosita mentioned, there's a component here of organizations, uh, corporations that are working with their own understanding of how privacy works, confidentiality and whatnot. And there's an individual's perspective on how privacy works. And again, also the interplay there of that individual's rights of consent to that information. For national statistical organizations, our legislation, which predates uh, the first, the Second World War, gotta let that sink in for everyone, um, 1918, updated in 1971, last major revision in 1971, and again, slightly amended in 2017, touches on some of this, but again, before most of our privacy frameworks even came to play uh, in, in Canada. So for me, in terms of the, the experience that we have, it's mostly one of social acceptability. 
you're going to let that repeat, which goes back again to that trust and transparency. We have to be out there with our decision makers, our policy makers, our decision makers, Canadians explaining what we're doing, how we're doing it, how decisions are made, how, and I see the chat, how suppressions of certain data elements are, are maintained. And again, maintaining that within a professional context. And uh, that, that's the complex role to play and, and changing both the perceptions of the people working in that, that domain, but also more importantly, how we're using that data going further. Um, my last comment to this is that social acceptability is in two components. It's both an organizational one and also one with individuals or, or policymakers. Um, the organization also has to adapt its methods and procedures. And this has been my, my literally my tram, my, my uh, discussion over the last maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, has been how organizations, national statistical organizations, also need to adapt their administrative procedures, their administrative policies, rather than just focusing specifically on their legislative frameworks and how that needs to adapt. And I'll stop there. That is really helpful, uh, Dr. Derger. And I think uh, I think you can stay with the video on because I have a question for you and Federico <laughs> linked to what both you have said before going back to Maria Rosaria and Rosita. And my question is actually, uh, you both mentioned the, the statistical acts. Uh, and uh, now this data act is something that is entirely separate from, from statistical acts. But my question is around whether, uh, you know, do you think it makes sense to have a separate legislation and, uh, um, and go a separate way for regulating access to privately held data, if that's a solution, or whether the update of the statistical acts can already help addressing some of the challenges that you, you both mentioned and some of the localized problem you also mentioned, Dr. Deloche. So maybe if you wanna start, Dr. Deloche, since you're on the, on the video, and then we have Federico jumping in afterwards. That's a very good question. In fact, um, we updated the Statistics Act in 2007 very slightly to clarify both the independence of the chief statistician, but also the process of how we acquire privately held data. Um, there's a request for information process, which we give <coughs> sorry, to the minister, providing him an, a, a viewpoint in terms of how, what we're acquiring from a very high level. We are transparent to Canadians and to the organizations by publishing this on our website. But prior to that, we engage with the, the organizations um, throughout time so that we can ensure that by the time we get to the RFI and finalize uh, the process, we've applied a, a multiplicity of administrative tools internally, uh, the necessity and proportionality framework. So to make sure that we're not asking too much data from the privately, uh, from the privately held data or from the organization. And we've uh, looked at other sources of alternative data is it administrative data that another organization within government collects? Uh, at which point, why am I collecting it again a second time from an, or from an organization? Again, that, that question of, of responsive burden and uh, reduction of, of administrative burden overall. Uh, my perspective on this, and we've had multiple conversations internally at Statistics Canada, is that the interplay between multiple different legislations cannot forget the National Statistical Organization. And what I mean by cannot forget is that it is in our case in Canada, constitutional requirement. So when we come back to uh, organizations looking at other pieces of legislation, we have to make sure that it is not enfreiné. It does not touch and reduce the intent that policymakers had when they drafted the Statistics Act back in World War One, and uh, that is fundamental for us because that this is like la raison d'être of the organization to support and inform decisions for policymakers and writ large benefits of Canadians. I hope I answered the question. You, certain, you certainly did. And uh, thank you very much again for sharing your, your insights on this. Federica, do you wanna uh, jump in before I go back to Rosita and Maria Rosaria with a, with a question for them and then we do a final round. Sorry. Federica, do you think you want to uh, weigh in on whether, you know, uh, the data act as a separate, you know, horizontal legislation would uh, be complementary or replacing, or how do you see the relation with the update of the statistical act? You also mentioned that Uruguay has a statistical act that is from 1994, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes. So do you think these are like, uh, the urgent thing to do is the update of the statistical acts and some of the rules that we're discussing today should go in there, or and a separate act as the data act will also be helpful in you, according to, to your perspective. Um, see, 
Yo creo que este por un well, lado I believe on one hand it's necessary to update our statistics law. In order to regulate access to administrative records for the public sector, but also to incorporate privately held data. And if this should be separated from a data act, well, evidently, the data act has a larger scope and it's broader. Evidently, that's a discussion that needs to take place. As I mentioned in my presentation, a discussion that needs to be held with the relevant stakeholders, the e-government agency, for example, the public sector in general, and obviously to include the private sector in this discussion. And perhaps they are two parallel paths. And we can try to identify what they have in common. I think we're in that process, undergoing the initial discussion right now. Helpful as always. I have a question for Rosita and Maria Rosaria. Maybe Maria Rosaria goes first and then Rosita jumps in. Um, so the question is, Maria Rosario already mentioned it. The, um, there are rules for the use of this privately held data that is accessed by the public sector under the Data Act. Uh, but um, the question is more generally, how can we make sure that governments use the data they have accessed uh, in an ethical way and for the specific purpose that was um, initially uh, thought? So under the Data Act, I think I understand this is really regulated and that there are some, uh, some specific provision on that. So Maria Rosario, if you want to elaborate on that, and then Rosita can jump in. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, no, indeed. Um, but I, I want to make uh, sure that um, everyone uh, it's clear to everyone here that the B2G provision in the Data Act are really limited to specific exceptional need. So our focus is not even on the purpose, it's not on the kind of data, it's not that, that's why we don't limit it, uh, we don't limit the B2G to any specific sector or use cases because what's um, what triggers the B2G provisions um, is the exceptional uh, need to use the data that is defined in, in Article 15 and I, that I briefly mentioned in, in the introduction. Um, then um, the request from the public sector body to the private sector company uh, has to um, respect some very, um, very well um, uh, defined criteria in the Data Act in Article 17. Um, so the public sector body or the union institution uh, agency or, or body shall specify exactly data that are required and has to demonstrate the exceptional need for which the data are requested. So the burden of proof is on the public sector body. Has to explain the purpose of the request the intended use of the data requested, the duration of the data use, uh, to state the legal basis for requesting the data, and also specify the deadline by which the data are to be made available or within which the data holder may request the public sector body to withdraw the request. Um, uh, then the data has to be destroyed when the purpose of the request has been fulfilled um, and um, so we think that you know by providing these harmonized proportionate transparent uh, mechanisms for business to government data sharing for exceptional needs um, we provide the kind of safeguards um, to the public to the private sector entities to make sure that then they, they, they can also trust that their data will not be misused um, and then all the requests would have to be made available, not the data, but the request. Um, there is the one solid principle that also applies in case of 
uh, emergencies to make sure that a company is not bothered um, by uh, you know um, a lot of requests for the same data set from different public sector bodies. Um, so we uh, we tried to make the system the, the mechanisms as much as clear and 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 trustworthy as possible, um, and um, to make sure that you know any public sector data misuse the data. Um, and then we also operate by assuming that public sector bodies in, in the European Union, by default, they work for the public interest, for the benefit of the citizens of the society. So um, they respect the, the European values. So um, um, we hope that, uh, that we provide enough guarantees to, make to, to, to private companies to make sure that the data is not misused. Thank you very much, Maria Rosaria. Rosica, you want to weigh in? Yeah, and I think that's an important clarification, right? That these are kind of in extreme circumstances. I think the question is, how do we define extreme circumstances? And I think here we can get very philosophical about it, right? And I think one practical, um, maybe, solution, um, and this is something that we've tried during the pandemic when we worked with the three telcos in Belgium to, to be able to work with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of uh, Digital um, to provide them with insights, is actually setting up an ethics committee. And that ethics committee is actually sometimes consisting of philosophers, right? People that can, can kind of philosophize on what is ethical or righteous of, of data. And, and that, that kind of, you know, uh, I, I would say enabled a bit the, the trust that we had for, to build up this so quickly. Um, and that data ethics committee is completely independent uh, when it comes to kind of the incentives of, of the parties involved. And that was quite, quite interesting, right? But I think the other very practical thing that we can be maybe thinking about putting in place when we talk about transparency is um, great that certain data sets have been accessed to fight the pandemic or to you know provide social benefits to people that suffered from landslides but do these people whose data is being used know that that their data has been used maybe just a quick you know notification push notification that their data was used in for such and such purposes would you know kind of trigger that transparency mechanism and, and allow for, for more trust in, in the future. So yeah, these are just a couple of very practical examples and thoughts. One has been tested, which is the Data Ethics Committee on the push notifications, not yet, but I think you know that's what we as citizens or people that work in the data space would like to see more of. Thank you very much, Rosita. And I invite Pierre and, and Federico to turn their, their camera on because we're getting towards the end, but I would like to give you all the chance to say a few words uh, for a few concluding remarks. We got a few questions in the chat around uh, the role of the UN uh, in establishing a global framework or some, some guidelines uh, to uh, help with this question of access to privately held data. So I think this is something you can, if you want, you can comment on as well as uh, any other comment you might have or takeaways from from this uh, from this webinar and then after we well we'll, we'll start let's start with uh, with um, maybe Federico then Pierre Marie Rosaria and Rosita as a, as an order of, of speaking and then I will say a few words to conclude but uh, it was very rich so um, thank you very much Federico you can uh, you can start and then Pierre gracias Martina thank you Martina this webinar has been excellent to exchange ideas, to exchange different points of views from different countries and from different regions. And obviously from both public and private sectors. And this law, this data act from the UN, excuse me, from the European Union, at least here in Uruguay and in our region, is giving way to a discussion for the entire continent of South America. Until now, we were having this discussion based on different experiences, like the one I shared of trying to access data from mobile network operators, MNOs. But now, we see that there's an acceleration. We are being forced to delve deeper in this discussion, forcing us to all sit down and have this discussion to see how we can establish clear rules 
in order to access privately held data and how to share them. And taking into account all these factors that my colleagues have mentioned, the transparency, data privacy, personal data protection, notifications to the users about the use of their data, all that information is very timely. It's based on all of your concrete experience that we can base ourselves in order to discuss their application here in South America and Uruguay, that it not be something hypothetical, it could be something grounded on your experiences for Uruguay and our region. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just building on, on my previous uh, colleagues' inter interventions, um, to respond in terms of what the UN uh, and this panel can look at, um, two, two aspects. The first one is we talk about in Canada of social beneficial activities as a means to actually, uh, and we're proposing that in new legislative frameworks, as a means for organizations to engage with private organizations to use the data. Again, from an NSO perspective, we already have this uh, for, for decades in our organization of, of acquiring uh, data from organizations. Uh, and the other one is really very important, I think that was talked about by Rosita and Frederico in trust and transparency, is that ethical framework that we talked about. That ethical framework is very important in Canada, and especially from an NSO perspective, we've implemented a necessity and proportionality framework to look at precisely how to acquire that data and in what case. Um, to, to me, that's, that's key. Uh, and from a public policy perspective, uh, policy and decision makers uh, are actively engaged on that social acceptability and that ethical framework. So again, I, I, I would welcome to have a conversation more robust on that because I see that as supra legislative discussions above data acts and data governance acts and above a regulatory framework that falls secondary in nature. What are those ethical considerations and that, that public policy debate that we need to have on the, the acquisition of that data? That's what policymakers and decision makers, in, at least in my context, are discussing. Yeah, that is a very, very interesting point. I see that Rosita agrees. Uh, but before we go to Rosita Maria Rosario, some final remarks. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, I can uh, tell you that the European Commission is more than willing to um, keep working also with the UN to um, advance this discussion because as I tried to convey the message that the B2G provision with the Act are, are indeed quite limited and also, um, but it, I, uh, we think it's a good starting point at least to, uh, we established for the first time in new legislation that for example, when there is a public emergency, data has to be shared for slow, full, full stop and also for free. So it will be very interesting also to try to move this discussion from the European level to the global level. So work um, in coordination with you, uh, also because in, in the world we live in very much interconnected and also the, the events, um, the, the dramatic events of, of the last weeks have shown um, uh, we need to uh, find ways, collaborative solutions um, to address um, global problems and um, data is, is the key, um, is day by day, is, is more and more important in all the sectors, in, in, in all the countries, because data is information, so has to be shared if we want to solve the problem. Um, so uh, we are willing to uh, keep on this um, discussion and to also scale it up, uh, because that's what's, what is needed. Thank you. Yeah, that is uh, indeed, con there is a lot of things going on right now that uh, invite for more collaboration. So Rosita, the floor is yours for final words and then I will close. Well, echoing everything that was said, I certainly agree on everything related to, to trust. And um, I'll just build up on that and say that I repeat myself actually from what I said before, but society empowered by data is only when the society is data literate. And you cannot trust anything that you don't understand. So I do think that investment in proper data literacy at the individual organizational, both public and private sector level is very key. And here also bringing the perspective I've spent the last five years in East Africa. Um, and, and, and I know that this is a major challenge for us to leverage the data properly and to trust the, the organizations to use it if we don't understand it, right? 
over from my side. And it, it's been a great conversation. Thank you, Martina, for facilitating it. Thank you very much to you all. And actually, I hope that we have achieved the objective of this webinar, which was starting from the data to spark a conversation that, that uh, goes a bit beyond that around, you know, what does it mean access to privately held data and uh, what's going on at the global level. So I would like to sincerely thank the panelists who have done an amazing job with a topic that is not super simple to, to convey and explain sometimes. So thank you very much for the way you presented things very, very clearly. And thank you very much to the participants who asked some very, very good questions both during the registration phase and now in live. Uh, I just want to invite you to stay tuned. Uh, there are, there are going to be other webinars from this series, so if you want to participate in the upcoming webinars, follow the website of the UN Statistical Division and the Twitter for the most up-to-date information. I think our colleagues posted the Twitter handle, which is UN Data Forum. And uh, yeah, it was a really a great pleasure for me to moderate this conversation today. And thank you very much to everybody who joined. Uh, we'll be speaking soon and probably there will be more conversation on this topic very soon. Thank you very much.